All right, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to start out to, to say that this is the Scoggins subcommittee, not the Gunner subcommittee. Uh, Chairman Scoggins and Chairman Estration both had bill, other bills to present in other committees. So I'm kind of taking over for now until one of them shows back up to get us going. Uh, before we get started, I want to recognize uh, our judge of the week, Judge uh, Tane Kell. We, uh, he and I go way back to when he was in the attorney general's office and I was working in the governor's office. So it's been a long history. And it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, first bill we're going to call up is uh, Representative Smith's 1352. And whenever you're ready, let me charge you up here. All right, sir. Yes, should be good. Go All ahead. Right. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, House Bill 1352. This deals with unclaimed property in the state of Georgia. Um, this law hadn't been updated since 1990. Uh, so here we are in 2022. Um, back then, most people did, probably didn't even have an internet when uh, uh, they were trying to go after their unclaimed property. But just to compare Georgia with the with nation, uh, our rates, the national average of rate of return of return of property is 38%. In Georgia, our rate of return is 9%. And we don't, I'm, I don't like to compare the other states, but I'm going to use Florida as an example. Uh, their rate is 59%. So I think that's huge. This, this property is the property owners. It's a citizen's property. And so what we're trying to do is um, make the database more searchable and make it easier to use. Um, you can use a third party. It allows you to use a third party to go after this unclaimed property. You don't have to use a third party. You can do it yourself or your personal lawyer. You can go after it. But using that third party, if somebody is involved, they will pay an annual fee. And and I want to say, and I've, I've got uh, Josh Belafonte is here with me too, and he he's certainly been extremely helpful on this bill. I want to say that fee is $1,200 a year they pay uh, to be that third party representative. And when they do, they, they can't go over 30% in charging for their fees. They can go up to that, but they can't go over 30%. But that's a brief summary of the bill. If you want to get in more depth, I'd be more than willing. I know, know Josh would to come up and answer any questions that you might have, but we're trying to return that property to the citizens of Georgia. Uh, I, uh, I spoke to uh, Mr. Belafonte earlier about the bill and was uh, I asked him the question, will I get more junk mail <laughs> on people wanting to, telling me that I've got money out there somewhere? Uh, but he said uh, from the folks that he represents, no, it'll be people that are right. telling you that you have something out there that more specifically. And I take it that's your understanding of it as well. Absolutely. I, even though I would think the department does send out notices or there are notices online and some people don't use a computer, you know, as well as others. I'm one of those that doesn't use one as well as others, but just knowing and that somebody lets you know that there's property there, there's a certain amount of money. It may not be a very large sum, but that's still your money and a proper way to go about obtaining that money. Uh, a little assistance is, is good. I think. All right. So. All right. Anybody have any questions of the author? Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't know if we have anybody online or not. Dude. Yes. The, I'm trying to make sure that that uh, to his point about getting the junk mail, because we get mail every day with somebody saying you, you know, you won this, you earned that, you got this. How is this going to how, how are people going to know that this is for real? Well, right now they can know by going online and going to the DOR department website and seeing that they have. Sure, it would instruct people to go. But I, you trust people to go, but there, there are only a few companies that are in the business that actually go after this unclaimed property. They do it as a legitimate business and they pay their fee. So those people will probably definitely reach out to someone, but I don't know how to control mail that goes out like that. I'll be honest with you, because I had two mail pieces sent out on me this weekend and didn't know it till I got home has my picture and my phone number on it. Mm. And I didn't authorize it. 
So how do you control that? That's that's a great question. I wish I knew how, but it, well, I'm not a- asking how to control it because I know we, we can't. But I'm trying to figure out how to because I mean I support what you're doing, but I'm trying right. to understand how do we make allow people to really know that it's real and not junk mail or junk. Is there something in in your process that? Yeah, I, I, I'd have to. You I'd like to refer to Josh if I could. You understand see if my he's question? A, I'm just trying to. Yeah. How, how do we? What's different that make, they will make people know this is real? Because we'll end up still leaving all of that stuff on the table if we don't think it's real. That's true. Uh, that's a good question. How do I know that's authentic? That if I receive something in the mail, is it authentic? It's going to take an initial contact. If I received it, I'm going to have to make a contact somehow. Maybe call the Department of Revenue would be my contact. I'm just thinking out loud. Yeah. But they're the ones that have the property. And if yeah. third parties. I'm just, I'm just thinking that somewhere in here, if it's not already in here, we need to put something that will differentiate this from the rest of it. Yeah, I guess it's, you know, people have to initiate if it's coming out and it's stating they have unclaimed property, uh, they may have to verify that through the Department of Revenue. Maybe they verify it through the Secretary of State's office if they have a business license in Georgia or registered as an LLC if there are an LLC. I guess that would be a number of ways that first come to mind to me, but I hear I hear your concern. And... Okay. I think Josh uh, Mr. Belafonte, do you have anything you want to add to it? You can come up right over here. Thank you. Thank you, members of the committee and Representative Smith. Um, two things I would say. One, there's a provision in the bill, it's lines 213 to 217, that prevents the information that somebody would gain by searching the database being sent for any reason other than assisting someone with unclaimed property. So I think that could go to the, mm-hmm. the junk mail piece to the question of <laughs> Um, how does someone know it's real? I mean, there would be the permit that they would need to get if they're not an attorney. And so if somebody's doing it on a fraudulent basis, um, then there would be, you know, existing laws to address that. But but there's nothing in here specific on like a use of a seal or anything that they would know. Um, but at least for the third party companies that do it, they don't have an, inc- I mean, their incentive would be notify somebody and then frankly, leave them alone. <laughs> it wouldn't, it wouldn't behoove them to bother them. Um, and keep calling them, but but I don't. There's um, yeah. I'm, I'm not concerned about them keeping the call. I, I just like me. If, if I went to my phone right now, like, and there was something on here that said you have property, unclaimed property somewhere. I, my first reaction to that would be, okay, you're right, whatever. <laughs> right, right. And so what I'm trying to figure out is there something in your process that if I looked at this and I saw you have unclaimed property, that I would know that that is real versus something else. Yes, I mean, it, it's, not, it's not explicit in there, but one of the things that the, for example, if you are presented with a contract and there's a contract form in here, you would have to provide the amount, the last known address of the person. So if you got something that had somebody who you knew to be a deceased relative or a deceased friend that might leave you something, you would be able to see that and I think that adds to the level of comfort versus just a piece of mail saying you have unclaimed property. Um, there's nothing in here that mandates that, uh, but I think certainly any of the third party's incentive would be to get you to respond. And so the more information they can provide you, the more likely it is that you would think it's real, I, I would think, versus just a, you have unclaimed property, call and, and you know, uh, we'll, we'll work with you from there. All right, uh, Representative Dreyer online, and I don't know if you're unmuted or not. I I should be unmuted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I would also think that when these notices go out, it could um, include some information uh, prominently placed that that they are, um, you know, licensed by the state of Georgia to do this. Um, And, you know, that there is, I think, as uh, Mr. Belenfante pointed out, um, there are criminal penalties if somebody is falsely holding themselves out um, as, you know, specifically permitted by the state of Georgia to do this sort of thing. So I, I would bet, um, I would suspect a marketing person could 
you can figure out some ways to lend some credibility to this when it's mailed. We don't you think, Chair Smith? I, I agree with you. I, I you know I'm open to any way that you know it clears it up, and I can't think of some right offhand because this, I hadn't heard this question till today. But I mean, why not? Let's let's clear it up and make sure it's authentic. I guess is what we're looking for. Is this is this unclaimed property advertisement authentic? So how do you do that? Yeah, I, I would I would think that the the companies that were doing this would would have some really good marketing people, and they really have a, you know, basically a, a licensure certification from the state of Georgia that that the marketing people for these companies could put in a prominent location. Um, um, there is a chance I think it gets thrown out. I think that's an, unfortunately a byproduct of um, every everything else that we get. But but for the most part, I would I would think these folks probably have a, have a can develop a pretty good way to, to, you know, rise above the, the other stuff. Just, just my hunch. I, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. I, I think the most important thing about this bill is it brings the idea that we get property back to the individual that it's supposed to go to and not to the state. That's right. So, That's right. All right. Um, I think we have uh, judge Paget. Is that right? Online to speak to the bill. Yes, sir. Yep, there you are. Yes, thank you. Um, there's just a couple of concerns on this bill that re that applies to probate court. And um, Cal King with the State Bar Fiduciary Section has done an excellent job of providing some suggested language. But currently in the bill lines 54 through 58 provides that a copy of the will should be provided to certain people. And then further on in the bill lines 108 to 111 allows electronic copies in the that the originals be destroyed. Well, we as probate courts never want original wills destroyed. They should never be destroyed. And in 54 to 58, we feel that the original will should be filed with the probate court of the last known resident of the decedent. Um, and then we'd like to see some tweaking to the language of 108 to 111 to, a, to not allow the destruction of original wills. And that's our main two concerns with this bill. All right, Judge Pageant, I got the 108 to 111. What was the other one you said? It was 54 to 58. Gotcha. All right. Mr. Chairman, yes. if I could respond, we're agreeable to adding language to make sure that's, that's taken that. care of. Mm -hmm. okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. All right. All right, Judge Pageant, that, anything else? That's it on this bill. All right. Anybody have any questions for Judge Pageant? Not seeing any. All right. Um, as to the changes to the bill, I think it's uh, Judge Paget's suggestions. I, I don't know of any others that we need to make. Um, we can draft a substitute. We'll draft a substitute with a, that included right there, 54 okay. through 58 and 108 through 111. Okay. And you have some language now, or you want to add that in and bring it to the full committee? We'll add it in and bring it to the full committee. Okay. All right. Then um, I'll entertain a motion. We pass. Is there a second? Representative Dreyer, it has to come from you, I think. Second. All right. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? I don't think there is. There's nobody else to do it. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Appreciate it, Mr. We'll, Chairman. Members we'll move of the, the bill on to the full committee. Then. Yes, sir. And we'll have that substitute. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just make it note. All 
right. Uh, this time I'll call up um, House Bill 1350. I'm sorry, not 1350. Excuse me. Excuse me. House Resolution 769. Sorry, Representative Wade, the seniority takes precedent. Oh, <laughs> Don't do that. I want to see how it's done. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. No, 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 you got it. It's, it's your committee. The chairman is here. So we just get started. Oh, sorry. House resolution. How's the dean today? How you doing, Mr. I'm good. Chairman? How you doing? I'm doing fine. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are here for uh, House Resolution Seven Six Nine, and uh, Dean Smiley. If you Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, I serve as chair of the Columbus uh, House delegation, and. Uh, the city council in Columbus uh, has forwarded me this reciprocal sovereignty immunity um, uh, reg, uh, uh, bill for a house resolution, something they want to study as, as it involves uh, carrying out the duties and operating vehicles in, in states that are contiguous to uh, Georgia. And of course, Columbus has been right across the river from, from, uh, from uh, um, Phoenix City, Alabama, and trying to get some kind of clearance on what uh, what could we do to alleviate risk in the various governmental operational aspects of it. And so what they did, they passed a resolution asking the Columbus uh, delegation to present to the members of the General Assembly a study committee to look at doing this during, during the interim. And I was very honest with them. I told them I would introduce this bill, but that I would ask the members of the committee uh, not to do anything to, to, to move it forward because I just know that study committees, I'm a former chairman of rules mm -hmm. and uh, knowing the system uh, that uh, the likelihood of a study committee during the election year is not the, the proper, may not come about. So that's what I'm, I'm, we're putting a stake in the ground asking that this is something that we will continue to take notice on and to look at it in future uh, general assemblies. But at this time, I, I, I did want to introduce, but the, the feeling was, and I've had a great conversation with the chair of the rules committee and the chairman of the committee. So I, as a matter of courtesy, I wanted to come and explain it and thank you all for, for providing a hearing for it, but ask that you not take any action on it. That Appreciate really, you coming today. Okay. Thank, thank you all very much. Sorry. What we got left? Okay, House Bill. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the House Bill thirteen fifty, uh, Representative Wade. Thank you, Chairman. And would you tell us what bill you're working on and the LC number? Please? I sure will, and I appreciate that. And I will not be able to do it as smoothly as my <laughs> friend, the Dean did, um, <laughs> or as quickly, though that would be the goal. Um, House Bill 1350, we're working off of LC 44-1972. I do want to first say that um, since dropping this bill and prior to today, I have received some feedback from some folks, and there may be someone to speak to the bill today. I'm not sure. I'm going to work with them to try to address some of their concerns and strengthen the bill. There's also some similar language as it relates to uh, in the banking industry when accounts have specific beneficiaries listed that are not subject to probate, that we want to potentially look at those two issues and then incorporate those in this bill. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, if there's federal consideration that via a substitute, but definitely look forward to the conversation and, and ultimately, um, I will say I'm happy that it's only two pages right. that will probably change based on the feedback I've received thus far from concerned uh, advocates, you know, for what goes on in probate court, especially. Um, and I appreciate their, their insight. This is not my wheelhouse. Um, <laughs> even though my name is will, um, this is not my wheelhouse. Um, okay. but I have as a banker dealt with clients that have gone through situations, um, 
who you know had a family member pass, and I, I'm even now been in my career long enough to unfortunately had a few clients who passed away and had to. Sometimes the banker gets involved, uh, at least as a pseudo advisor, on helping them gather information, right? And so the reasoning behind this bill and the reason that I want to try to help improve the notification process is something that happened in our community. And I've been told through our sheriff uh, that this has happened in other communities in which in some cases, um, most executors do a really good job of notifying the heirs uh, under current statute. But sometimes there's some, uh, I guess, uh, the individual executors may have their own process as it relates to notifying beneficiaries known or otherwise the trickle down beneficiary, if you will, if it's a, uh, a church and they had a name change, uh, there's lots of things that we could contemplate, but ultimately I, my goal and the purpose uh, and the intent for this legislation is to ensure that heirs and beneficiaries are notified in a timely and accurate manner. And that that responsibility should be on the executor or executrix of an estate and that the probate court just continue to do what they do, which is ensure that the information is provided and, you know, they, they subsequently review that information uh, and assume it is prepared as accurately as possible on the executor. Um, and then if the executor were to fail to do that or fraudulently do so, it could be evidence, you know, potentially in a criminal case, should the executor make the wrong decision to use those funds outside of the uh, determinants within the will. So that's really the presentation of the bill. Um, I'm definitely willing to answer any questions. Uh, and again, I would like to uh, let, uh, I think it's the judges on today. I, I think she was speaking earlier, Judge Pageant. Um, I would like to connect with you to make sure that we can incorporate some of your ideas to, to uh, make the bill better. Well, I, you know, I, you and I talked about this yes. bill when you first started about it and uh, being a retired probate judge myself, um, I think it's a good bill. Uh, we may need to tweak it just a little, uh, but uh, when we first started talking about it, it was going to put the responsibility on the clerk's office to notify the heirs at law from the will. And we changed that and put that burden on the executrix or the That's executor. Right. And I, I like that part of it. that really, that really kind of sewed the bill up for me. Yes, sir. Uh, and um, I want to first ask if we've got any questions from the committee. Uh, and then we'll go to uh, Judge Padgett on Zoom, I think. Is that correct? Any questions from the committee? Judge, um, I, I just would be interested in knowing um, what the what the probate section of the Georgia Bar thinks. But, I, you know, there's. I'm curious about that, though. I, I do want to say that I would generally defer to your experience on it. Uh, I've just worked with some um, partners who were executors and uh, just want to make make sure this is this is feasible. But again, I, I am going to defer to your experience on this. What I'll do is I'll get uh, Kyle King with the state bar and uh, he does a lot of. Uh, he's online. OK, he's online to speak to the bill. And so um, we'll hear what. Kyle says about it. He probably probably pretty much does all the probate proceedings on the uh, any bill that comes through. So okay. he's very good. So does that answer your question, uh, Representative? It does. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Who we got now? Um, Kyle King. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we have been in contact with the. Uh, Council of Probate Court judges and, and have uh, gone back and forth with, with Judge Paget on this. Um, we, I think we're generally on the same page that there, there are some tweaks, there are some things we want to make sure uh, are, are dealt with, but we think that they are able to be dealt with. Um, I think because of the, the probate judges having a uh, little bit more responsibilities under this bill than, than they currently have, that, that they may feel a little bit more strongly than we do, but um, certainly there's some, some uh, proposed language that I believe Judge Baller uh, submitted to uh, Chairman Efstration uh, about this that, uh, that would, would clean up some of the, uh, some of the concerns and, and you know, make sure that it, as we say, plays nicely with the rest of the code. Okay. Chairman, right. can I, would, can I ask can you, a question? Yes, sir. Um, thank you for your input. And, and if um, word could get back, um, uh, uh, Legislative Council asked if, 
that information and that suggestive language could be provided in a word document if that if i i don't have that gentleman's uh, contact information but if you could share that and we definitely will um, respect um, that document as it's submitted and try to use the language that's preferable to, to all parties. Thank you, sir. Any Thank other you. questions for uh, Mr. King? Seeing none. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As always. Okay. Okay, Judge Paget. Good afternoon. How are you? Good. How are you doing today? Good. Um, the, your, only other, the only other point. We got your representative point. in here today. Do what? I'm sorry. We have your representative in here today. Yeah, I see you. <laughs> um, the only other point other than what Mr. King has brought up in, in his um, suggestions, and I think and I haven't seen what Judge Ballard presented to, to Chairman Estration, but one thing that came to me by reading this bill is if you have a situation where the only heir is the widow, she's the only beneficiary in the will, is she violating this code by not sending herself notice that she's a beneficiary? That would not that, be my intent. That's no. not but the that's intent. what the law says. I mean, that's what this bill says, is that she must provide notice to all beneficiaries and provide proof to the probate court that she did it. So I think there needs to be some ability to acknowledge as a beneficiary, rather than requiring notice to everyone to give the beneficiaries opportunity, just like they acknowledge service of the petition, they can acknowledge that they are a beneficiary. I'm amenable to that. I don't have a yeah, problem. But other than the, the language that um, that Kyle King has provided, probate courts do have an issue with it being in the code that we are required to review every will because not every probate court has time to sit down and read every single will. Metro Atlanta courts, even some days in my court, most days in my court, I could review every will. I do have a staff member that does review every will to make sure the named executor is the person being appointed, but I don't make them read every beneficiary listed in the will. And I think you're putting a burden on the courts to require that. But other well, than those, those are well, Judge, I think that responsibility would fall on the executor. And if the exactly. executor, executor failed to do so, then that would be grounds for removal. Exactly. And, uh, but the way the yeah. bill's written currently, that is that burden is on the probate court okay. to review well, the will and make sure that the notices coincide with the with the will. And it's like Judge Ballard said. If you appoint, if, if the executor's a thief, they're going to steal no matter how much notice is required. Okay. I, I appreciate that. I would say that we have speed limits for a reason and that I know people that if my mom is a person that every person in my community would tell you that there's no way that she would ever get a speeding ticket, whether there was a sign or not. She doesn't drive fast. She would actually probably get a ticket for driving too slow, but this is to keep the honest honest and also to provide um, what I believe. And I'll, I'll say this as a community banker that, and I'm not against executors and I, you know, I, I will probably have to serve in that capacity at some point in my lifetime. The, the concern that I have is, is if there are people that um, see that there's an opportunity that would go unnoticed because nobody's paying attention that those beneficiaries, uh, an example, possibly a nonprofit, if they were not made aware that they were a beneficiary directly by the person who prior to their passing, uh, if they don't receive notice, then those funds could be put at risk and it, it might lead someone who has some other issue. Maybe they're not intending to be a thief, but they're borrowing from Peter to pay Paul think they can put it back and all of a sudden they're in a different situation so i don't want to create more work for the probate that is not my intent my intent is to ensure that 
if a person is named in a will and they're an heir or a beneficiary, that there's a process that's transparent, that they receive notification, and that there's some verification the executor met that requirement uh, within, honestly, the person that had passed away, their wishes are met. So I'm willing to take language and consideration. Um, I also will share this with the committee that um, I, I would love feedback on, and that would be if you have a very complex will, um, and let's say you, and I can speak to this, not to belabor the committee's time, but um, my wife's family is a large family. Her grandparents had 14 siblings. And in some cases, and we know for specific, my, my wife's grandmother, when she passed, she had one daughter that had passed prior to her passing. And there was some confusion as to what percentage of a piece of property was to be conveyed to her surviving husband, who was not technically, as we say in North Georgia, blood kin, right? right? And and having those things spelled out, and it may take longer time to determine who some of the heirs or beneficiaries are, depending on the complexity, that I want to make sure that we provide appropriate time once a executor and the will has been read that they provide notice. So I, I, I want to be very flexible with the courts and, and not create burden. I ultimately just want to make sure that we keep the honest honest and make sure that folks receive notification if they are a beneficiary or an heir. That's my goal and that's my intent. Okay. Thank you, Representative Boy. Um, Judge Gunter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess this is going to be more directed to Judge Padgett. Um, would a judicial notice provision in here uh, work for that situation you were talking about where you have just a sole beneficiary of a widow? Um, and the other question I have is, I, I don't, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what you mean by judicial notice. That the court could take notice that there's only oh. the beneficiary, and that is the executor who has presented the will, which would mean that they that, have notice what's in it. That that would be that that would work perfect. Yes. Um, okay. what concerns me, you know, is just that situation. And, you know, most wills that we have, the majority of the wills, it's a, the only people named as beneficiaries are the heirs. So if we were allowed to take judicial notice, that, that would satisfy that. And we have no problem with the notice provision. It's just placing the extra burden on the court to read every will that comes in to make, you know, the way it's written right now the notice provision itself we're good with okay and would it be uh, a way of reducing the number of wills that the court would have to look at if we took out those that are probated in common form and just use the solemn form or vice we versa? don't we rarely have common form probates I mean, in, in the county, the size of mine, I may have two common form probates a year. So leaving them in is not a burden. Okay, gotcha. All right, thank you. Thank you. And Judge Padgett, I think that maybe us treating the notice the same as we do the notice to heirs, don't you think that would probably be an easy way to make sure that we get those Beneficiaries yes. and will noticed the same way to the last known address. And then if you don't well, know where that person lives or they've moved, you've got your certificate of service showing that they have been notified by their last known address. That, yes, that would be good. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Judge Patrick? Thank you, Judge, as always. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you right. Judge. All right. Okay, any other questions for uh, Representative Wade? If not, uh, we're not voting today, so That's Representative fine. Wade, thank you, and uh, we'll see you I'll, soon. I'll keep working, and I'll get a substitute for your consideration. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's the last one. Thank you for today. Uh, appreciate your time.